Hey guys, Woodruff here. <clears throat> and as I'm, I'm talking about communication, I'm apparently losing my ability to communicate. Um, but we're almost there. There's only a few, a few things left and I'm determined we're going to get this done. We're going to make it through. So, um, let's talk about troubles that stroke, uh, people with strokes that have difficult, <laughs> I'm just laughing at myself. I can't even get this sentence out. Um, oh my God, I think I would have better luck with she sells seashells by the seashore. Um, anyway, uh, let's talk about the problems that people that have sustained a stroke may end up having related to communication. <laughs> so let's see if I can communicate about the communication issues. Um, so the two of the main ones you're going to hear about, the first one's called aphasia. And remember I talked about with dysphagia, um, that with a G, that there's also dysphagia with an S. And so if you hear the word dysphagia with an S or aphasia with an S, I have them here, you want to see them, they're the same thing. Effectively, they're used interchangeably. Um, dys means more of like a problem with where A means without. Um, but effectively what they are both saying, and I remember which one they are because they have an S in them. So remember the S is for speech. Um, whereas the G, remember dysphagia with the G, that's going to be for gulp or like swallowing things. Um, so what it is, it's a loss of the ability to express or understand speech, or it's also repetitive speech. So it's issues in um, either receiving messages, sending messages, or um, repetition in um uh, what he called um, uh, speech that's happening. So there's that. There's also what's called dysarthria. And I talked about this back when I talked about um, the NIH stroke scale, where it's where they lose like the ability to articulate. So I remember dysarthria, I think the ART and is it's we cannot articulate speech. And so uh, uh, I can't like they can't um, uh, they don't have like the ability to like have strength in their muscles. So think about like after a really hard leg day, how uh, you can barely walk is the same kind of thing is that like their muscles are so weak that they cannot have the strength to even articulate words like I can like this. Um, they can't do that um, because of the loss of muscle tone. So I have some videos and stuff, which obviously I'm not going to show you. Um, but um, that just over like what dysarthria is, and this is just an example, I think it helps to see it, but you can um, Google and um, see some videos about it. Uh, but there is uh, two main types of aphasia. I'm going to mention three here. There's two main types of aphasia that you're going to need to know about. There is global, um, which means they cannot express and they also can't comprehend like they are like they can't send messages or receive them. Um, this isn't as common. Um, it can happen if they have a severe, um, you know, injury in that area of their brain. Um, but most of the time we're dealing with either expressive aphasia or a receptive aphasia. So let me tell you a little bit about the differences here. So expressive aphasia could also be called Broca's aphasia because that's the area of the brain that this is um, dealing with. And, the, and uh, it's a lot of times what I have difficulty forming words. Um, but the way you can remember this is expressive aphasia. They have trouble expressing themselves or Broca's aphasia. Their speaking is broke. They're speaking. Yeah, I said it right. Okay. Speaking is broken. Um, they speak in short phrases and they usually have to use great effort to get those phrases out. Um, they can get frustrated very easily. These are, again, I think I talked about this when I talked about people that have a left hemispheric or left brain stroke are more likely to have this. Like they have all these words in their head, but they don't know how to get them out. Um, so with these patients, like you have to be super patient with them um, because it can be really hard for them to get sentences out. Um, and sometimes you know what they're trying to say, but you got to give them time. Um, so, and I'm giving you a hint, by the way, because I know that there's a question coming up saying, what do you do for this? <laughs> so I got to stop giving you hints. Um, but like these people, they'll sound like they might only have one word or only a couple words. Like I put down here, they maybe omit small words like is, and, and the, or they may just wash hair when they like had a longer sentence that they wanted to say. But, um, you know, with these patients, like a good example is I had a patient that um, all she could say was, yeah, like she had expressive aphasia. And so I had to listen to the different inflection of how she said, yeah, like sometimes I'll be like, hey, do you want to go to the bathroom? Yeah. And I was sitting there, I was like, do you need to do a number one or number two? Yeah. And so like, you know, like, so sometimes I was like, okay, all she could say is yeah. And I had to kind of learn. And I mean, eventually, obviously I did that like one time and then I realized all she could say was yeah. So I didn't keep doing it and be like, I know all she can say is yeah, but I'm going to ask her a non yeah question. Um, but yeah, so needless to say, 
um, they have difficulty getting words out or expressing themselves. Now, people ask too, like, oh, well, why don't they just have them write stuff down? They also have trouble um, getting stuff out in, in writing a lot of the times too. So it's not just that they need to write something down. Um, these people really struggle to get ideas from in here out and communicate them, whether it's through speech or writing. Um, but you're going to notice that they say like short phrases, they're going to get frustrated a lot because they have the idea in their head, they just can't get it out. Um, so yeah. And then this is just a, a guy that has um, expressive aphasia. He, he d demonstrates really well the issue. Um, so family members trying to communicate with a client who has expressive aphasia. What information can you provide this family member on how to effectively communicate with their family member? Um, so uh, that's a lot of family members in one sentence or two sentences. Um, so a... A person that has expressive aphasia, um, again, they have trouble getting words out, expressing themselves. Um, so like I mentioned, it's not going to be just about, oh, hey, write it down. Oh, hey, like, you know, just find that way, like some other way. You have to think about what the block is here. Someone that has expressive aphasia, it's not that they have an issue up here, like that they don't have a message to give or they're not understanding you. Like if I asked that lady, hey, do you need to go number one or number two? Um, she knew what I was asking. There's no, she has no trouble receiving my message. So um, I don't need to help them by sending my message any different. So some people may say, oh, I need to talk slower because they're like when it's someone else's response is slower a lot of times I want to match that energy like if someone's really slow talking with me or slow to respond a lot of times I want to match that and be like okay um, but like that's not what the problem is here because then it's just going to make them feel worse like they're not stupid they understand my message I just need to find a way to get them to be able to communicate their message to me so one of the best things that we can do is something like a communication board it's where they point to a board and they can give an answer because um, um, a lot of times that's going to be a lot quicker than them um, trying to get it out. and when I say quicker it's not that we're trying to rush like we have to get it done like right now it's not that it's a rush but it's going to decrease their frustration if they can get their message out. And so sometimes the best way is going to be through, um, uh, what do you call it? Communication boards. Some people might say gestures, but you have to think about gestures is something I'm doing. And I do gestures are great. If a patient's not receiving my message, like let's say like, um, I had a patient who had, um, we're going to talk about receptive aphasia. They can't receive my message. Um, if they can't receive my message, it'd be great to do a gesture and be like, Hey, are you hungry? Um, like, you know, cause maybe they're not understanding what I'm saying, but for someone with expressive aphasia, they understand me. They're not, you know, misunderstanding my message. They're not, I'm not miscommunicating my message to them. It's just, the issue is, is that they're, they need a different way or a portal to get their message, um, from their brain. That's getting a little, um, discombobulated into, um, a, you know, a, a safe, not a safe, sorry, a um, stable message to me. So communication boards are probably one of the best ways, but we'll talk about some more communication um, tools into in general uh, to use. So there's expressive aphasia where they can't express themselves well. And then there's receptive aphasia, which is um, difficulty comprehending messages. So this can be where they're either um, they have trouble receiving my message. It's kind of usually a combination. They have trouble receiving my message um, or um, the, what do you call it? Um, when they give their message, I can't understand them. So when I think receptive aphasia, they can't receive my message and I can't receive theirs. Now, I've had patients that they can't receive mine, but I can receive theirs. And I've had patients that um, they can't receive. Well, did I say the same thing? <coughs> I have ones that they can't receive my message, but I can receive theirs. And then I can receive their message, but they can't receive mine. So it just varies. And keep in mind, again, these are like these like really strict categories when sometimes things are more fluid. Um, but just keep in mind that uh, with this, um, these patients are different in that they are the opposite of the brocas or the expressive aphasia and that they're very wordy. So just like there's brocas aphasia for expressive, there's Wernicke's aphasia for receptive. And um, with Wernicke's aphasia, um, effectively, I remember Wernicke's is wordy. So these patients are going to be um, compared like expressive aphasia. It takes so much effort to just get one word or like short sentences out. These people, they have unlimited sentences and they're saying a whole bunch of stuff but here's the thing is is that it doesn't make sense they're usually speaking in long sentences they make up a lot of words they add in unnecessary words 
um, and um, they have difficulty understanding what you're asking to. So they just kind of go on these tangents. Now, this one is not as common, but I've seen it a few times. Um, and yeah, like an example of this would be, I mean, you can see it here in this picture, um, but like the, um, I think the example I usually give is, is that like, um, it was something along the lines of, you know, I go into a patient's room and then I was like, hey, what can I do for you? And they're like something like, banana something on a Tuesday and I was like oh what like you know and they're sitting there and they kept saying it over and they were like a banana flies high on a Tuesday and like they're saying it like I'm stupid <laughs> like like I'm not getting their message and I'm like I don't understand you um and uh, what they were trying to say is I need to go to the bathroom um but it obviously was not coming out that way but in their head they really thought that they were saying that but they you know kept had they had a lot more words choice words to say after that that didn't make sense um, but they have trouble receiving my messages sometimes or other times they have trouble giving a message that I can comprehend. Um, they're usually unaware of their mistakes. So most of the time they're very blissfully happy. And I have a video that I'm gonna not going to show on this, but uh, that um, definitely recommend looking at that is a good displaying of it. Or you can um, Google and watch other videos. Um, but yeah, so they have trouble with receiving this sweet guy. I think his name is Bryce or something. He's so cute. Um Super sweet, but lots of people can have different variety of issues. So you can see some people, like if you look at each of these examples and like if they're thinking I want an apple, like this would be someone with expressive aphasias, uh, aphasia where they can't, they can't get the full message out. Um, then like all of these are really expressive aphasia. This one, I want an apple and all they can get is noises out or I want an apple thing, want I, yes. Like, you know, they're having trouble getting out where this one is more of the receptive aphasia where like there's a whole bunch of words and one person is, or both people are not receiving each other's messages. So um, what communication tools can a nurse use for a client that has aphasia and how they help? So we've already talked about a communication board. Um, those can help because a lot of times a patient can just point to those, um, to what they need. And I'll, I have a picture of one on the next slide. And so it just gives them a bunch of choices where they can say yes or no. They can spell out words. Um, they can also um, point to pictures of things that they might need. Um, other communication tools, um, you know, they're... Um, Oh my God, I was going to say, I'm sure there's like, I know there's computer programs and stuff that can help uh, allow people to talk to each other. But I feel like I'm, I think when I say communication tools, I'm thinking more of like a device or an actual thing like that. But I think I was just, I maybe should change that question to like, what helps good, what makes good communication? Um, anyway, this is a communication board. So like, you know, which apparently I need tonight. <laughs> so yes, to get these messages out. Um, but um uh, they, um, and by the way, if you're ever wondering, like, why don't you just get some sleep and make videos a different night? Like, um, it doesn't seem to, it doesn't seem to matter. Like I will always do these videos and help my students out. I am not a huge fan of making videos. I think I'm a little bit better in person with getting messages out that I'm trying to say, but yeah, there just gets to be a certain point. So it doesn't really matter. I could wait till tomorrow and do these videos. And I think I'd still be like, blah, <laughs> you know, so some days are better than others, but I think I just, um, I don't get nervous, but I just, when I start talking, like, I don't know, my mind is just a special place or I don't know, maybe I'm just not meant to make videos, <laughs> but um, I'll keep doing it as long as people want them. But sometimes I feel like I'm just like rambling on like a crazy person. I feel like maybe I'm, uh, it's getting worse, but <laughs> who knows? Um, we'll see. But needless to say, um, yes, I hope that I'm still coming across and giving a clear message that's helpful for you. Uh, so these boards effectively, like I mentioned, they can easily point to what they need versus like trying to have to have a longer conversations or have them struggle um, to give good communication. What you want to do is you want to decrease distractions. So you don't want um, other things that are going to be um, getting in the way of a person um, receiving or hearing your message. Um, so turn down the TV, you know, things like that, the noise level. Having a lot of patience, whether it's expressive or receptive, you need to take your time and really give them time to, um, you know, to um, try to express themselves, especially with expressive aphasia, because it can be so hard for them. I'm um, talking to the patient on an adult level. They're not, you know, um, you know, stupid or, um, you know, it's not that they don't understand. It's just sometimes they need um, extra help. Um, what do you call it to, uh, depending on the type of aphasia to get their message to you or to receive your message. So you don't need to talk down to them. It's not that they have a hearing issue either. You need to talk at a normal uh, volume and tone, 
Um, you don't need to sit there and yell at them if they're not responding. It's not, again, it's not a brain issue where it's, they, um, it's not a brain issue with intelligence. These are all intellectual people. And it's also not a hearing issue. It's a, you know, it's a literally a um, ability to receive or um, completely process cognitively your messages or an inability to um, take the messages in their head and get them out. Try to do one thought or idea at a time. Don't overwhelm them. Utilizing yes or no questions is um, will make it a lot easier on them. Don't interrupt them. So even if you know like what they're going to say, do not interrupt them. Let them get their thoughts out. Um, gestures and demonstrations can help if they're having trouble receiving your message, um, but um, like for receptive, but it's not going to be as helpful for expressive because again, it's kind of like um, when you speak to someone who speaks a different language, like um, me sitting there, I can use gestures and demonstrations, but um, you know, it, it's not always a, sometimes like even with the gestures, it, um, yeah, here, I'm going to back up. That's a bad example. Let me say, I'm not going to use that as a, I'm not going to use that as an example. Um, let me say this is, is that. Um, gestures and demonstrations change how I am giving my message. So remember with expressive aphasia, they are having no problems receiving my message. I don't need to do a gesture. Like when I tell a person like that lady that I told, Hey, like, do you need to go to the bathroom or do you need to do number one or number two? She heard my message, her brain processed it. And she, in her head said, Oh, I need to do a number one or whatever she was saying in her head, but she couldn't take that message and then get it out. So it doesn't matter how many gestures I do. So I could do like one or two, like, you know, um, or like pee or poo, like, you know, do some stupid little dance or something. She hears my message. I don't need to dance for her. I don't need to do some sort of strange, um, like facial thing to like get my message out. I don't need to talk louder. I don't need to like simplify it for her. she understands what I'm saying. She just needs a way to get her message to me. So gestures and demonstrations aren't very helpful for expressive, but they could help with receptive. Um, and then don't force communication. If they don't want to talk, you know, they probably need the practice, but it's not something we want to give them time to process it because it can be very overwhelming for them. Okay, we're almost there. Few things left. Next is stroke and uh, stroke, <laughs> uh, visual and perceptual problems. 